from KSAT 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Hi there. Good morning. It is Thursday. It is May 18th. That's right. We made it to Thursday. We did one oh, day closer to the weekend, which is always a small victory. Yes, it's very small victory, but a, a good victory. I guess we've been celebrating all week, though. We have, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful day outside. Gorgeous sunrise today. Lots of blue sky out there. Justin Horn is here. Yes, and the humidity came down just a little bit yesterday evening. If you felt it, it felt really good. And we were kind of starting off, you know, two points in the mid 60s. It's a little bit humid, but not as bad as it could be. So it feels really nice outside. Here's what I'll tell you. You know, when the humidity goes down a little bit, we get those good swings in temperature. And I think that's what we're going to see today. Those numbers will jump up pretty quickly. And by this afternoon, it'll be downright hot, but it is late May. So let's take a look at some of the headlines here. And as we look outside, you can see clear skies. So there's that swing in temperatures. Comfortable now, hot later. A few storms out west today. Nothing to worry about here in San Antonio. It's going to be for the folks there in Del Rio and Eagle Pass. We'll watch for a few storms that may try to get close tonight. Then it's Friday night. That's our next focus. When we see a front, yes, a front coming in uh, into Saturday morning. That's going to generate some storms, but this is going to be generally after sunset on Friday and into Saturday morning. We'll detail all of that coming up here in just a bit. 75 right now, dew point is at 67, calm winds. And we do need to mention that today is one of those air quality days. Ozone is going to be a little high for those who are sensitive to that kind of thing. If you have asthma, just a heads up, uh, it's an ozone alert day. Pollen count, molds are high, 2,710. Grass is low at 30. And your case at 12 hour forecast, noontime, 83. And as I said, up near 90 this afternoon, 90 at 5 o'clock, mostly sunny skies, and then down into the 80s this evening. Much more on that potential for some storms Friday night, Saturday morning coming up. Let's get over to Stephen now and talk traffic. Good morning, sir. Well, thankfully, it's a good talk over here, Justin. Things are looking pretty are looking pretty great. 281 at San Pedro. You could see the uh, right now the north and southbound lanes don't appear too bad. And as we get a quick look around town, um, great shots here at 1604 there at Petrenko. Ten at Zavala. We actually had a vehicle fire that was causing a lot of smoke off of the main lanes. Thankfully, didn't see any issues that uh, it led to along the main lanes of I-10. And thankfully, also at 35, we're seeing some smooth traffic. But keep this in mind, although it's quiet out there from the map and what we're seeing on TransGuide cameras, we still have plenty of the construction. You can see a lot of it in and around the Alamo City. I was talking to David Sears about this a little bit earlier. 281, big talking point here, guys, because we know those southbound lanes have reopened, but guess what? 281, we still have asphalt work taking place on the north side. So this will actually be current up until May 21st, but we all know that work is expected to continue. But right now, for today, 9 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon, alternating lane closures on the frontage roads in both directions at Overlook Parkway. And I'm already seeing a little bit of the congestion building up out there along the northbound Lanes. So just plan your commute ahead of time. Scan this QR code. It gets you in the know before you go. We have a full list of all the current closures on our website. That's ksat.com slash traffic. And as a quick reminder, there's a new feature on there. A prompt asking you, what are some trouble spots that you find in and around the Alamo City? Is it 35? Is it 281? Maybe it's US 90. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, let us know what you're finding out there on the roadways, and we're going to work to find you a solution. Mark Steff. Thank you, Steve. And top stories this morning, a brawl at a bar on UTSA Boulevard overnight ends with four people shot, one of whom died. It happened at a bar called Privat Social Club. San Antonio police say about 20 people in two groups got into a fight inside the bar and security teams pushed the fight outside. And that's when police say someone in one of the groups pulled a gun and started shooting. One person was hit in the chest and died at the hospital. Three others were shot in their legs. So far, there is no description of the suspects and no arrests have been made. Officers are now reviewing security footage to find out exactly what happened. A different shooting overnight also had a deadly end. This one happened just after midnight on Austin Street near East Jones Avenue. Police say two men were in the middle of some kind of argument and they eventually shot each other. Officers say one man was found dead inside the house. The other was injured and taken to a hospital where we have now learned he has also passed away. And some residents at an apartment complex on the northwest side of town had to evacuate after a man crashed into a staircase there, destroying it. This happened on Callahan Road near Fredericksburg just after 1030 last night. And police say that man was cited for driving without a license after he drove his SUV into that staircase. Two apartment units were asked to evacuate, and management is helping them find a place to stay. No one was injured in that crash. Let's get you caught up on the rest of the day's news. At today's night at 9.
We are learning more about the Air National Guardsmen at the center of the Pentagon Records leak. In new court filings, federal prosecutors allege that Jack Teixeira ignored several orders from his superiors to stop his searches into classified intelligence that was unrelated to his work. Those were warnings that came months before his arrest for posting a mass of Pentagon documents online. Although President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy say some progress was made on debt limit talks earlier this week, the matter is still unresolved and the threat of a default continues to loom. Some are calling for controversial action from the White House. They want President Biden to invoke the 14th Amendment, which would allow him to raise the spending cap without Congress's approval. One of the consequences of failing to raise the debt limit are payments on billions in federal student loans and grants that could stop. But experts say students and schools may avoid a financial meltdown since the fight is happening close to the beginning of summer and not toward the end when many of the payments go out. Montana has become the first state to ban TikTok within its borders. The new bill forbids the social media app from being offered on mobile app stores to any users in Montana. Penalties won't apply to people using the app. Experts say this law will face serious legal challenges, though, and the big question is how the law can be enforced. Those details remain unclear. There are conflicting stories over what a spokesperson for Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan Markle have described as a near catastrophic car chase involving the paparazzi. Witnesses are sharing their stories of what happened Tuesday night, and the New York Police Department says the event did not even register as a, quote, incident with them until the couple's statement. The company behind a popular fertility app called Premom must pay $200,000 in federal and state fines for leaking their health data. The app was also banned from sharing personal health information for advertising purposes. The legal action comes in the wake of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision last year striking down federal protections for abortion. If you are planning on traveling for the Memorial Day holiday weekend, the FAA says next Thursday, the 25th, will be the busiest day for travel. More than 51,000 flights are scheduled for that day. The FAA plans to handle more than 312,000 flights between May 24th and May 30th. Slower sales and rising costs, including more theft, are cutting into profits at Target. Their net income fell nearly 6% in the first quarter of this year. The retailer says losses to theft could be well over a billion dollars this year. Apple is introducing new ways for people with some disabilities to use iPhones and iPads. One feature will make it easier for people with cognitive challenges to set up their phone. Another will allow the phone to read text labels out loud on things in the real world for people with vision problems. And that's today's Nine at Nine. In the other morning headlines, another child has died after coming across the southern border, and an offer goes on the officer rather goes on the right of his life try, trying to make an arrest. Plus, would you put your teenager in an Uber by themselves? So Uber is banking on the fact that some parents will, and the most detailed look at the Titanic ever. Our David Sears is here with all the stories. Those images are stunning. They may have to redo the movie. Oh. <laughs> you think those actors are available? Um. Most. Or we'll some? have to go get some more young <laughs> Not ones all. again. Not all. Not all. What is yeah. that? The movie's like 25 years old, right? I think it, it sounds older. about right. If you haven't seen these images, wait, yeah, you'll think, wow, that's not the Titanic. Among the increased flow of migrants at the southern border, another tragic story, though. An eight year old little girl has died. She was in the custody of U.S. Border Patrol at Harlingen. According to the agency, she experienced a medical emergency. EMS services got to the scene. She was transported to a local hospital when she arrived. She was pronounced dead. She is the second child to die this month. A 70-year-old unaccompanied child from Honduras died at a shelter in Florida. Immigration officials are saying the end of Title 42 Customs and Border Protection facilities are being overwhelmed, and that is putting migrants at risk. All right, let's take you to Iowa. Cops have a car pulled over. They are talking to the passenger who has uh, had a warrant out for his arrest. The passenger gets the driver out. He slides into the driver's seat. You can see the cop jumped on the hood, got his, point, got his gun drawn and pointed. And wow, things really get crazy. The Patrick McGarty is the officer. He's on the hood and he's yelling for Guider. That's the driver to stop. And he just keeps going. It's, put it on the bridge. Put it on the bridge. Stop the car. Stop the car, man. Stop the all right, you see the shot of the officer up on the hood. Now you see him grabbing a hold of the top of the car. He's hanging on for dear life. This is from a video from another officer who is actually in pursuit. 
and eventually the red car, the driver, guider, goes into a gravel parking lot and then he's going to hit a ditch. So you see the officer back on the hood. And here he is in this gravel parking lot and here comes the ditch and the officer ends up flying off of the car and he lands on his back. The other officer who was in pursuit hits that ditch and it goes. I'm okay, man. Go get him. I'm all right. You sure? Uh, you good? Go get him. Dude, he's, he's, I'm stuck. I'm in the yeah, he's stuck all right. He's laying on his back, injured. Guider is eventually caught. McCarty suffered a back injury, expected to be okay. Guider entered a guilty plea to serious injury by vehicle as part of a plea garden. Last week, he was sentenced to up to five years in prison in order to pay restitution to Officer McCarty. Mom and Dad, if you try driving your kid all over town for this and that, and you're getting a little tired of it, Uber has a new plan for you. They are starting up a feature that allows teenagers from the ages of 13 to 17 years old to ride alone. So the parents call Uber, the driver shows up, the parents put their teenager in the car, they give the driver a PIN number, the app records audio during the ride, and the parent can sort of ride along and keep up with the progress. Parents can also contact the driver at any time or Uber support during the ride, as far as the drivers are concerned, Uber says they're going to only allow highly rated and experienced drivers to take unaccompanied teens. Uber has done some research, consulted with Safe Kids Worldwide to come up with a feature. They will start taking teens for a ride Monday in more than a dozen metro areas. And finally, you are looking at the Titanic at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean like you've never seen before. Look at these images. These are scans from deep sea investigators like 700,000 images that created the 3D view. Magellan and filmmakers Atlantic Productions just released the images they collected last year. It shows us the entire wreck 13,000 feet down from bow to stern. Remember, those two parts of the ship were separated when it sank back in 1912. The ship sank after it hit an iceberg on April 14th of that year. More than 1,500 people were killed. No touching or disturbing of the wreck when they were taking these images but very strict protocols were adhered to. A lot of people have mixed emotions about it. There's some uh, people who have relatives that were on the ship and wow. they're not real wild about all this happening because they think it should be just a, a memorial laid to rest there in the bottom of the ocean, but other people want to know exactly what happened. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a... I know there are strict too. protocols for going down that you can't touch. Right. Uh, it's basically a graveyard, uh, right. obviously. And in case you're wondering, the movie came out in 1997. Yes, wow. I looked I'm, that up too. <laughs> I'm not sure James Cameron can afford Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio these days. And unfortunately, Bill Paxton, who was a major character, That's right. has since passed, passed away. away. Yes, sir. They'd have to get some young actors to, to do that one scene again, though. We're going to do a remake of Titanic? Why not? Well, with They're these doing everything else. <laughs> with yes. the, these images now, you could like advance the story to... Jack. That's true. Aww. What, what That's was true. the line? Jack. Yeah. What, what did she say to him? Was it, uh, never let go. Never let go. Never, never let, let go. go. And, and now the we controversy can see remains. The ship at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. All right, David. Thank you very much, sir. 9 11, 76 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. It is graduation season, and a new round of young adults are entering the real world, and that means learning how to manage their finances. An expert shares her advice on how graduates can set themselves up for success. Look out there with live cam. Nice this morning at 76 degrees. Not too hot yet, but I, I'm seeing that things may get up to 90 today. Oh uh, yeah, I think 90s mm -hmm. are probably a pretty good bet for a lot of us. I, uh, you know. It is late May. We've, we've been able to avoid it for, for a while. It's true. And Maybe I, not today. And I've been waiting for a week to see what effect this rain was going to have oh, on yeah. our drought index around Is that here. today? It's today. It's right now. Uh, so we'll see what, what the rain did. Let's take a look. Let's get right to it. Right, so this is last week, okay? So this is what it looked like last week. Right. Let me fast forward to this week. Some improvement, not as much as I yeah. thought we'd see, mm. though. You know, I, I figured we'd see a little bit more than that, but still, uh, this is improvement, and we're headed in the right direction. So Kerrville to Bernie, we're still in that exceptional drought. We need just a little bit more rain here to kind of lift us out of this. Uh, here at San Antonio and Bear County, we went from extreme to severe. Still in a drought, but we're moving down the list here. And uh, again, overall improvement for everybody. And there is more rain in the forecast, so hopefully we'll continue to see even more improvement. Rain chances next few days. Will we have more opportunities? Yes. Friday night into Saturday is the time frame I want to watch right now because we could see some severe weather 
during that time. Most of your Friday is going to be fine. It's uh, after sunset Friday into early Saturday morning where we could see some storms along a front, an actual cool front. And it's been a while since we've been able to talk about one of those. Uh, we've got an area of low pressure out here over parts of Mexico. That's bringing in some disturbances, and that's why I think we could see a few storms along the Rio Grande a little bit later today, but not here in San Antonio. That's one factor in all this. We've got another area of low pressure to our north. That's going to push that weak boundary into our area by Saturday morning. So let's look at the setup here. This is Friday. We're talking about tomorrow. Tomorrow. Today is going to be quiet. We've got mostly sunny skies all, all, all day long. But Friday morning, we start to see a front moving into parts of Oklahoma, producing some storms there. And then it pushes south. And so by 5 o'clock Friday dinner time, we're getting some storms across the hill country. Not here yet, but to our north, we'll see some of these storms flaring up. And then as the front tries to push a little bit closer into the early morning hour Saturday, this is midnight, we'll get some storms going right along the front. And this is when we could see some severe weather, hail, gusty winds, your main threats here. Uh, even going into 3 a.m., showing some storms getting closer to San Antonio and then perhaps uh, moving through, but probably weakening, uh, weakening a little bit by the time we get into 7 a.m. Saturday. And then by the afternoon, I think the threat kind of shifts off to the west and uh, we'll see a little bit less in coverage as far as showers and storms go. So if you're planning out your Saturday, that is the thinking right now. I think mainly Saturday morning is when we could see uh, impacts maybe to your soccer matches or whatever you have going on. Uh, the severe threat late Friday is going to be San Antonio points north. So that's as that front comes through. That's where we could see some of those stronger storms. And as I said, hail, gusty winds, the main threat, not a huge threat, but it is there. Flooding and tornado threat are very low. We'll go outside for you right now. We've got 75 degrees. Dew point is at 67 in calm winds, and we will see a big swing in temperatures today. We'll go from 65. That was the low this morning all the way up to 90. Air is just a little bit drier. And when you get the drier air, you get the bigger swings in temperature. So 25 degrees swing from the morning low to the afternoon high today. And here it is hour by hour. 83 at noontime. We'll get up to 89 by 4 o'clock. 90 at 5 p.m. And then into the 80s this evening. So it will be a, a warm day. And clouds will make a return tomorrow morning. So 91 on your Friday. And then a 30% chance Friday evening. We'll keep in a 30% chance on Saturday. And then a small chance Sunday. Another small chance coming up on Tuesday, but overall the pattern kind of quiets down a little bit as we head into next week. Thank you, Justin. Cooking, baking, management and safety and sanitation practices are the focus of the culinary program over at Lee High School. Tiffany Huertas shows us what students have learned this year and how some are pursuing cooking beyond high school. Good morning, Tiffany. Good morning. They are learning so much and they're, they can use all of these skills when they go home and they can also learn about the career behind all of this. This morning we have culinary arts teacher Marnique. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting us. Tell us a little bit about your program. So the program here at Lee High School has been for a, a long time. The students get to learn uh, food safety. They get to learn how to cook food from all over the world. They get to learn how to bake. They bake pies and cakes. Um, they learn the food science side of it. It's a lot of things that they really get to do and learn here in the program. They get to cater. They get to run a restaurant. So they get a lot of experiences in the culinary world here in high school. What type of impact have you seen? So the impact that I've seen, one, is that a lot of students get scholarships. We do compete in a lot of competitions. Um, and right now we're making our, our famous, uh, our award-winning salsa that we won two years in a row at the St. Phillips uh, Salsa Contest. They get scholarships for that. Um, they learn really great skills um, to use at home. And then a lot of these students actually go in, into a career in food service. Um, so they go on and take this and they go to culinary school and then go on, hopefully, to become master chefs. <laughs> and own restaurants one day. It's incredible what you learn and also they're, they're, they can teach their families as yes, well. Yes, definitely. That's a really big part is that I want to show them skills that they can use for their family. And they, they even bring things from their family here and they show me, I learn a thing or two about things that they have learned from their own family. So it's great. It's definitely a science and we want to hear from one of the students right here. Good morning. Good morning. What's your name? Ismael Hernandez and uh, oh, <laughs> I'm just here. Good morning. Well, Good morning. tell me about um, this program and what's your favorite part? Well, my favorite part is uh, basically engaging with different students and not only students, but different environments. Uh, sometimes people who are just like nervous or just shy to be open up to, you know, different people or different scenarios, 
you very really learn and uh, not only the cooking skills but social skills with other people, and it it really helps you in the future and uh, you know prepares you for m more coming stuff. You know. What's your favorite dish? I think my favorite dish is pasta, is, oh. or well, if I want to be specific, like I guess just fettuccine or you know something basic. The common thing, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, you really. I don't know what I want to say, but. I like it because you can, uh, you know, not only you like, oh, yeah, it's good, but you can learn what ingredients go in the pasta, in the dish, and maybe use it for something else, you know? And pasta is a science because I've, I've messed up on pasta before, so I'm pretty sure your pasta is way better than mine. Well, we're going to hear more from the students, and we're going to bring you that story coming up on the noon show. We'll send it back to you. Thank you, Tiffany. Anyone, Look forward to it. Anyone can cook. Uh, 921, 76 degrees. And after the big news about the Spurs getting the number one overall NBA draft pick, season ticket sales have soared, not surprisingly there. Coming up next, how staff with Spurs and Sports Entertainment are handling the rush from excited Spurs fans. 925, Wimby Mania is sweeping the city of San Antonio. That's right, nearly 24 hours after the Spurs landed the top pick in the draft, who will likely be French basketball star Victor Wimbayama. And the interest for the season tickets, they are soaring right now. Spurs officials say they've also seen 10 times the normal amount of web traffic and Spurs app downloads just since the lottery results. Great news. RJ Marquez stopped by the Spurs sales office where the buzz is building with excitement. <laughs> You've probably seen videos of Spurs fans cheering and honking after the franchise won the NBA Draft Lottery. Back at the AT&T Center, the mood was just as joyous. We celebrated for about five minutes, and it was lots of high-fiving, hugs, um, sips of champagne, and then 40 people hit the phones. Frank Maselli, the chief revenue officer for SSC, says the sales staff is working around the clock as demand for season tickets jumped within minutes. We're here till midnight last night, uh, working the phones and making sure people's deposits, the website was working properly, all of that um, to get in. The phones have been ringing off the hook here at the Spurs offices with fans interested in potentially buying season tickets. They tell us that they immediately got to work after the Spurs won the NBA draft lottery and despite very little rest, continue to take hundreds of calls. The work we've been putting in the weeks leading up to this to be ready for this moment, um, it just felt like, you know, a dream come true. Lindsay Beal has worked for SSE for 14 years and says the staff is busy answering several questions and requests. People want to know how many games they can get in with. We have 10 game plans, so it's a really manageable amount of games to come to in a year, um, payment plans. And fans who place a $100 deposit will get the chance this Saturday and next Thursday to pick their seats. It could bring one of the biggest years in Spurs ticket sales history. Well, until you really go through that process, it's really difficult to project that, but we're expecting it to be uh, record breaking. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Birthdays in August. <laughs> Oh, it hits. All right. Okay. Joint, joint effort, maybe. Yeah. 927, <laughs> 77 degrees. There's more head on GMSA at 9. Including what witnesses are saying about the alleged aggressive chase by paparazzi through New York that Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan Markle described happened to them earlier this week. Plus, training for a new job without student loans, a free local program getting some people on a new career path, and you could join the next class. We'll explain when we come back. The first class from the Generator Skills Accelerator program graduates today. The students have a chance at a new career thanks to the six-week program. As John Paul Barajas explains, their success isn't just paving the way for their future. It's also paving the way for the next group of potential graduates. I'm actually going through the process of, put, of filling out so many applications now that I'm really not sure what to accept if it comes in. <laughs> Creating opportunities. It's one of the main goals of the Generator Skills Accelerator program. Congratulations, everyone. This week, the members of its first San Antonio cohort will graduate with new skills to help them advance their careers. My career coach, Mary, and all the Microsoft team, 
They were always there, always checking up on all of us. Both Cynthia Hernandez and Dwight Chapman are soon to be graduates of the six-week program. They'll finish with skills in project management, along with help in resume building and job placement assistance. That's where our work just begins. We're going to bring in our national network of employers. We have about 420 employers that we work with nationally, which includes local employers. A program like this that doesn't cost anything to get involved in other than your time is a great investment. John Paul Barajas. If I can do it. Anyone else can do it, no matter how old you are. KSA 12 News. The Generator Vice President said nearly 350 people applied for this first partnership with the Alamo Colleges in the city, and they accepted about 60 who are all set to graduate today. Graduation comes just before their second round of classes begin next week. So Generator is planning to accept 60 to 75 people for the free program, but you must apply by midnight tomorrow. So we have a link to that application on our website at ksat.com. Outside with live cam. Got down into the 60s this morning. Beautiful Thursday out there across the Alamo City. Justin Horn joins us now with an update on temperatures. It was nice for a while, but we're already up to 77. So we've already gained 12 degrees from where we started this morning, 65. And with mostly clear skies today, temperatures are going to jump up pretty quickly. And I think we'll be up near 90 this afternoon. So it'll be a hot day today and tomorrow for that matter. A little more humid tomorrow on your Friday as well. 25 degrees swing for that morning low to the afternoon high today. So just a heads up there. Case that 12 hour forecast 83 noon time will be up around 90 as I said, mostly sunny at 5 o'clock and then this evening 85 at 8 o'clock down to 82 by 9 p.m. And uh, air quality, we do have to mention this one more time. Uh, if ozone bugs you. We've got uh, the unhealthy category today for those who are sensitive to that high ozone levels. And uh, that may uh, go for tomorrow morning as well. So we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, meantime, rain chances. Where do we stand there? Good uh, chance or decent chance, I should say, Friday night into Saturday morning with some storms. A couple of strong storms mixed in there, too. And then some uh, small chances by Sunday. We're going to take a closer look at that. Time it out for you, too. That's a long uh, frontal boundary that will be moving in by Saturday morning. That's coming up here in just a couple minutes. Guys. Thank you, Justin. Well, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy say some progress was made on debt limit talks earlier this week, but the matter is still at a standstill and the threat of a default is still looming, so much so that some are calling for controversial action from the White House. Some Democratic lawmakers want President Biden to invoke the 14th Amendment, which would allow him to raise the spending cap without Congress's approval. Section 4 of the 14th Amendment says, quote, the validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned, end quote. I've heard people say, well, it might be a way we can do this. And once you start down that slope, then no one's ever going to take the seriousness of our debt. Their only plan, which is no plan at all, is to ignore this fiscal crisis and do nothing to limit spending, save taxpayer dollars, or grow the economy. I mean, a default on the Treasury debt, uh, I can I can say with a high uh, degree of confidence, that would be catastrophic. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who has repeatedly warned lawmakers that the government may default if action is not taken by June 1st, said it is legally questionable whether or not the 14th Amendment is a viable strategy. Well, we mentioned this next story as news broke about it yesterday right here on GMSA at 9. And today there are different stories coming about about Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan Markle allegedly being aggressively chased through New York City by paparazzi. As ABC's Rhiannon Alley reports, more witnesses are speaking out about what happened Tuesday night. This morning, conflicting accounts over what a spokesperson for Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan has described as a near catastrophic car chase involving the paparazzi. The spokesperson says the couple was pursued by highly aggressive photographers in New York who drove up on the sidewalk and drove the wrong way down a one-way street as the couple left a theater. It became pretty aggressive. The paparazzi had access to the garage from where they were entering and they were being kind of manhandled by the bodyguard. Guys, let's get some spice, okay? After heading to a police precinct for safety, Harry and Meghan, along with her mother and a security guard, hailed a taxi to elude photographers. Guy in a suit hailed me. But the cab driver stopped short of calling it a chase. We made a left, they made a left, we made a right, they made a right. So you were definitely... So they were with us. New York's mayor also expressed skepticism. I would find it hard to believe that there was a two-hour high-speed chase. But if it's uh, 10 minutes, a 10-minute chase is extremely dangerous. 
But the mayor did call the paparazzi reckless and irresponsible, connecting the episode to the crash that killed Harry's mother, Princess Diana, who at the time was being chased by the paparazzi. This all happening Tuesday night after the couple attended a ceremony honoring Meghan and one day after a man was reportedly arrested outside the couple's home in California, apparently caught by private security lurking on their property. Prince Harry has been outspoken about the security of his family and has pointed to similarities between his wife's treatment and the treatment of his mother. While it's easy to say, well, it's far-fetched to imagine the worst case scenario happening. That is exactly what did happen to Princess Diana. You can completely understand where Harry being scared, being scared of things like history repeating themselves, comes from in a situation like that. Rhiannon Alley, ABC News, New York. Back here at home, Stop the Bleed training at Northeast ISD has a new sense of urgency in light of the mass shooting at Ma Robb Elementary School in Uvalde almost one year ago. The training has been required by law for several years. It requires participants to take an online class and pass a quiz prior to the on, hands-on portion. The in-person part of the class goes through three techniques, apply pressure to the wounds, packing a wound, and applying a tourniquet. It's voluntary for staff, now offered for students from seventh grade up. With recent mass shootings, the training feels more urgent. Unfortunately, these mass violence situations are shedding a light on why it's so important um, and definitely um, helping people understand, you know, why, why it would be a good thing for them to have. Northeast ISD students interested in the Stop the Bleed training must have permission from their parents. Those with permission will go through training with their school nurse. And they might be little, but some kindergartners at Menchaca Early Childhood Learning Center on the city's south side are learning the importance of CPR. They got to practice on teddy bears, and the school nurse says the lesson could make a life-saving difference for families far from hospitals. Camelia Juarez tells us how the age-appropriate demonstration is empowering little ones in an emergency. Baby shark, did 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 baby shark, did 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 a silly song, a soft toy, and a potentially life-saving lesson. The beat of Baby Shark is the pace to provide CPR to someone. That's what nurse Heather Seibert is demonstrating to all 300 kindergartners at Menchaca Early Learning Center. What number do we call for an emergency? 911. Using a teddy bear makes a serious conversation into a light one. They feel like they're at least doing something to help. They're not feeling helpless, they're feeling empowered. Although a five-year-old may not effectively be able to save someone's life, Seibert says the lesson could keep a child calm. They're less likely to panic, they're less likely to start crying, they're less likely to be scared when EMS does show up. Students can even show their parents what they've learned. Menchaca Elementary is on the far south side where the closest hospital or emergency room is at least 15 to 30 minutes away. Seibert says every minute matters and any child at any age can make that difference. Any sort of way to um, help themselves um, can be the difference between life and death. So it is really important in this area where our um, resources are so, so far, few and far between. Students received a teddy bear, a workbook, and a first aid kit, all thanks to the Southside Education Foundation grant. Right now, Seberg is looking for additional grant funding so she can do this next year. Gamalia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. 940, 78 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. A new round of college graduates are about to join adult life, and with the uncertainties in the economy we're facing right now, that can be daunting from budgeting and negotiating salaries to adopting good money habits. There are some things that new graduates can do to set themselves up, though, for success. It is graduation season, and young adults are facing adulthood amid a looming potential U.S. debt default, high inflation, and ongoing recession fears. It can all seem daunting for new grads navigating how to gain control of their finances. As CNN's Shelley Malashi reports, one expert weighs in on how graduates can set themselves up for success. Graduation season is underway across the country, and young adults are entering the real world amid an uncertain U.S. economic outlook. For current grads or recent grads, it's really important to make sure that you are not too intimidated by that. Personal finance expert Julie Alma Taveras says a bit of planning now can help new grads gain control over their finances for life and has these five money tips. Number one. 
Track expenses for at least six months to see your habits before creating a new budget. It allows you to see, okay, where's my money actually going? So that I can then, after that period, really start to think about how do I want to strategize in terms of how I spend my money. Two, use the 50-20-30 method where 50% of your paycheck pays for living expenses, 20% goes to your savings, and the last 30% is for things you enjoy. Three, learn to negotiate your salary. Research how much your role pays and advocate for yourself. That's going to give you a really great start right from the beginning in terms of salary that is only going to go up from there. Four, get health insurance coverage. Since many young adults are under their parents' policy, Tavera says this is a good time to shop around and get an individual policy that fits your needs and your budget. And finally, create a financial strategy that fits your short-term and long-term goals. What is it that I want out of life? Do I really want to start saving now so that I could buy a home in the near future? Do I really want to just focus on investing for an early retirement, perhaps? For Consumer Watch, I'm Shelly Malashi. 946. All right, it's going to get warm today, but I, at least it's looking kind of good for the weekend. Yeah, I, th I think it'll be okay. If you have plans Saturday morning, you will want to pay close attention to the forecast because I think we could get a few storms, maybe a couple strong ones, but it's not going to be widespread severe weather, okay? So it's going to be the hit or miss type stuff. I'm not a coffee drinker. Did want to show you this picture because ah. I thought it was funny. Uh, maybe I should learn to like coffee. It says I drink coffee for your protection. Aha. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's our sign, Mark. <laughs> yeah, it is. Is that accurate? Very is accurate. 100% yes. accurate. Uh, yes. yes. Let's yes. mass produce those. Mm -hmm. Especially on y'all's schedule. Uh, I, uh, yes. Uh, yes. A very early morning. But uh, great shot. We appreciate it. This morning was a good coffee morning. I mean, temperatures weren't terribly cool, but it was nice. It was nice. We had temperatures in the mid 60s, and now things starting to warm up. Uh, we're watching an area of low pressure off to the west. It's spinning out here. Uh, over parts of Mexico and that's throwing some disturbances in our direction. I think as we head into the afternoon, there could be some storms that make their way right along the Rio Grande, so Laredo, Eagle Pass, Del Rio. There could be a storm that uh, moves in your direction by the evening hours. I don't think it'll be a big deal. We will watch it here in San Antonio. We don't have to worry about rain today. Today is quiet. Tomorrow, most of tomorrow is quiet. 75 right now. It's Denson 74, Kelly 75 at a Randolph. We've got light winds and clear skies. Few clouds this afternoon, but not many. And I think temperatures make their way up to around 90 here in San Antonio. Most of us will be right around that 90 degree mark. You will find some of the warmer readings down to the south and west. 94 forecast high in Carrizo Springs today. So let's fast forward to uh, Friday morning, tomorrow morning. And uh, we're going to have a front across parts of Oklahoma. This front is going to make it here, believe it or not, but it'll take some time. So by Friday at 5 o'clock, Right along that front, you'll uh, see some storms starting to develop. So Dallas, down to maybe Waco, San Angelo, Abilene. That'll be the area we watch Friday around dinner time. But by the evening hour, storms will start to build, I think, in the hill country. And by midnight, we're seeing some of those storms move a little bit closer. Fredericksburg, maybe down to Austin. And then by early Saturday morning, maybe even pre-dawn, storms are moving a little bit closer. In this case, again, we could see some severe weather along this front. Not a lot, but some. Uh, hail and gusty winds being the main threats, and this could work their way. These storms could work their way down towards San Antonio by Saturday morning. So that's why I was saying if you have plans Saturday morning, this is something you want to pay attention to. And of course, we'll update the forecast frequently, especially on the KSAT weather app here over the next 24 hours or so. And then by Saturday midday, storms out west. I think the trend is for the storms really to stay west of San Antonio by Saturday afternoon. Doesn't mean we couldn't see an isolated storm, but I think the higher risk for weather is going to be out to the west. And then by 5 o'clock, this model shows everything kind of quieting down. The risk for severe weather late Friday night uh, is going to be there for the hill country, even all the way down to San Antonio and north along that front. So right now they have us at about a 2 on a scale of 1 to 5 for uh, for the, the risk of severe weather and hail, as I said, and gusty winds are probably going to top the list here. But even then, they're not terribly high. Flooding and tornado threat, I think it's fairly low. There could be some locally heavy rain, but it's just not going to be that widespread stuff we were looking at, say, a week ago. As you plan out your weekend, 30% chance of storms on Saturday. Again, that uh, is mainly going to be west, I think, late in the day. And then small chance for an isolated storm Sunday, 20% chance temperatures in the low 80s. So keep your weekend plans, but be ready to dodge a couple showers or storms if they do pop up. 90 today, 91 tomorrow. Low 80s this weekend, 84 Monday, 86 Tuesday and Wednesday. And
We're getting closer to June, which uh, we know what happens then. So we'll enjoy these uh, these 80s for now. What happens in June, Justin? <laughs> mm, I don't even want to talk about it. Uh, it's it's going to get hot. It will. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 949, 79 degrees. A new Fast and Furious movie comes out tomorrow in theaters, and we come back and look back at the long history of the movie franchise. The latest Fast and Furious movie races into theaters this weekend. CNN's Rick D'Angelo looks back at the more than two decades of history of Fast and Furious. I live my life a quarter mile at a time. June 2001 saw the release of The Fast and the Furious, launching an 11 film franchise. Go! Two years later, Too Fast, Too Furious raced onto movie screens. You know what DK stands for? What do you mean, drill? In 2006, the action left Los Angeles for Japan for the Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift. A lot has changed. You're right. Three years later, the core cast was back, but the word the gone from the title for the franchise's fourth flick, Fast and Furious. Home sweet home. 2011's Fast Five sent Vin Diesel's crew to Brazil and introduced Dwayne Johnson to the cast. That he's dead. I need to know for sure. 2013's Fast and Furious 6 ranks as the second biggest movie of the series in the U.S., according to Box Office Mojo. We're being hunted. That this is going to be a street fight? Furious 7 reigns as the Fast Series box office champ, with just over $353 million in the U.S. and over $1.5 billion worldwide. It also marked Paul Walker's final film role. I don't know why he's doing this. I don't give up on him so easy. 2017's The Fate of the Furious saw the action get even more over the top, complete with a chase involving a submarine. Look at me. I'm Black Superman. The series took a detour in 2019 with Jason Statham and Dwayne Johnson teaming up against Idris Elba in Fast and Furious Presents Hobbs and Shaw. It's been my entire life in your shadow. Now your little family is in my world. F9, the Fast Saga, arrived during the COVID-19 pandemic, with John Cena joining the Fast cast as Vin Diesel's brother. It's time to prepare for what's coming. You might want to buckle up. Bringing us to 2023, with nine core movies and a spin-off film leading up to Fast X. Jason Momoa takes on the bad guy role in a movie reportedly so full of action, Universal released a four and a half minute trailer the very week the movie explodes onto screens. Racing to the theater in Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. There's enough footage for another movie. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. How can they outdo themselves every time? I know. Uh, okay. Well, uh, 90 degrees today, 91 coming up tomorrow. Chance of storms late tomorrow night into early Saturday morning. That's the time frame we'll watch for a couple strong storms. And then uh, some isolated stuff this weekend. Not a big deal, but again, we will need to watch... Uh, really uh, kind of overnight Friday into the pre-dawn hour Saturday. All right, we will, but I appreciate the lower temperatures over the weekend. It'll feel better Saturday and Sunday. Sounds good. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Yep. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. See you back here tomorrow morning for GMSA at 9.